on November 12th, 2021 at ridegrtc.com. For the meeting notice, all written comments received via email by Carrie Rose Pace prior to 5 p.m. on the day preceding a meeting were provided to all members of the board the night before the meeting and are read during the public comment period of the meeting by staff following the two minute speaking limit and will be included in the minutes of the meeting. Also, per the meeting notice, this meeting is being live streamed on YouTube and will be available for viewing later. This meeting, I received one submitted comment in writing from Sally Brazil of Media Transit, Inc. Dear GRTC board members, since receiving our suspension notice after the board meeting on October 26th, we have researched the information given by the CEO during this meeting, which contributed to your decision on this matter. We had asked the CEO to correct this misinformation, but she was not willing to and told us on the, the phone call after the board meeting to email the GRTC board with any of our concerns. Here are our concerns again, since the only response we received was an email from Mr. Campbell stating we were attacking the CEO and staff. We feel getting corrected information and stating the facts is not attacking anyone. The CEO stated that a Supreme Court SEPTA ruling on political acts had impacted transit companies all over the country in regard to their transit ad program and advertising policies. After researching and calling other transit companies, Virginia and National, we have found no impact and no ad suspension anywhere else. When we then contacted OAAA, Outdoor Advertising Association of America, who followed all legal matters regarding outdoor advertising to get their take and they reinforced that no other transit company in the country has taken this action to suspend and the ruling really had no impact on current advertising programs. Even SEPTA has not suspended their ad program. Why couldn't a quick change in the wording on the ad policy, if even needed, be accomplished in a short period without suspending the whole program? During the first week after the board meeting, we had to cancel over $400,000 worth of new advertising for November, December, January, and beyond. Most agencies plan their campaigns months in advance, and their advertising dollars will now be allocated elsewhere. These were campaigns we had been working months on to get started in Q4 and Q1 of the new year. We were never consulted by anyone at GRTC to determine the revenue lost by the suspension. We were on track to have our biggest ad sharing revenue with GRTC over the next few months. Uh, Mr. Chair, I'm acknowledging the time. However, this is our only public comment. If you permit, I will continue reading it. Okay, continuing. Yes. She also missed. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Mm. She also misrepresented HRT income from their ad program, stating they received millions of dollars annually, when in reality they did 900,000 to 1.1 million with twice as many buses, along with paying for installation and removal fees and a full-time staff of two to three people. She implied media transit was not meeting expectations when we have succeeded in reaching our goals with GRTC for over 20 years. We admit COVID had put a damper on the program, but we were building back even better. Keep in mind the RFP for the handling of the ad program is bid out every five years and Media Transit, a certified woman owned business has continually been awarded this contract for the last 20 years with the most competitive bid. Getting back to the CEO's worry over the ruling on political ads, she recently sponsored an art bus using over $5,000 of GRTC's money to pay for the printing and installation of this bus wrap and donating the space valued at $1,500 per month. When reviewing the co-sponsor's website of performing statistics, they mention social activism as well as defund the police, BLM, and white supremacy. The website for Rise for Youth Youth, another co-sponsor mentions activism to change the current state legislation regarding youth in prison. These sponsors are both on the back of this GRTC bus. This seems highly political and she violated GRTC's own ad policy at the time it was done. And perhaps that's another reason why she is requesting it be changed now. This would not have been approved if it were a paid advertisement. During the board meeting on October 26th, when asked how media transit would be notified, the CEO stated that a phone conference had been set up later that day, October 26th, to give us a verbal notice of suspension, which was done. There were multiple people on that call, but not anyone from procurement. We received our written notice of suspension from procurement on 11-3,
with the start of the suspension being October 20th. We asked that the suspension date be corrected twice, but the CEO informed procurement that was the correct date and it will not be revised. We did have a few contracts submitted prior to October 26th that were not honored. One last note, we had our largest campaign ever with Caesars buying September through December, spending over $24,000 per month. The advertiser and art were both approved by GRTC. We were excited to bring this campaign and revenue to GRTC. Caesars was planning to do a copy change mid-flight to switch to NFL branding for the football season. They presented art very similar to the previous campaign around mid-October for the copy change to be done on November 1st. GRTC still has not approved their art since it was submitted and requested creative changes that would have been a large additional expense that was not factored in when contracting for the space in production with GRTC in August. The window policy we have used for the past year was that 50% of the total windows on the bus could not be covered per the CEO's request and multiple large format ads have run on the buses complying with this policy since then. She's now saying that the policy was misinterpreted by marketing and she meant 50% of each window. We looked back on the recent sponsored bus wrap that she herself approved the art on and noticed seven windows did not conform to what she was saying she meant with her policy. We believe she's prejudiced against the adver this advertiser over its approved or advertising policies need to be prepared. Julie Tim, you are so right. End of the Facebook post. Within one day after that post, we were told GRTC would not be approving any art until after the board meeting on the 26th, pending a potential change in policy. This seems like a very strange coincidence. With Caesars being delayed for over a month and not completing their ad copy change, it takes two weeks to print and install 45 buses. They may feel that they did not the full, I believe they're missing the word received, did not receive the full value from their campaign and possibly cancel the remaining two months or a lost value of $44,000. They were even planning on renewing the $94,000 contract in 2022 again until this happened. We continue to support GRTC and have always had GRTC's best interest at heart, but cannot support all of the misinformation that was said at the October 26th board meeting and continuing conflicting statements regarding Caesar's copy change and the start date of our suspension. Again, Tim has been a partner with GRTC for 40 years and Media Transit for 20 years. Thank you for your time, and we will be glad to send any documents you ask for. Sally Brazil, Media Transit, Inc. Mr. Chair, this concludes the public comments. Thank you for reading that. Um, as you all know, this is um, one in a series of similar letters from, uh, from, media, from media Transit and Brazil. Um, I did reply to one of them, and I'm going to read that reply, which you received, uh, the board members received, and I think, uh, Ms. Tim, I'm in, Ms. Brazil, I'm in receipt of your letter, and, if, and have seen some other communications from you expressing your disapproval of our decision to make a pause in the advertising program of GRTC. We are grateful for your service to the Greater Richmond Transit Company over the years. I'm sorry that our need to evaluate and perhaps to alter our advertising policy has caused you such distress. But let me be clear, this is a policy of the Board of Directors. We appreciate the judgment of our CEO and executive team and are fully in support of the need to re-examine our current advertising strategy. We have made this decision because we are responsible for the health and economic well-being of this public company. Please refrain from attacks on the CEO and staff and from attempting to besmirch the management of this company in letters to our partners and constituents. It will not alter the responsibility we bear for proper policy and management of GRTC, and it will not contribute to a positive outcome for anyone. Um, this is. I'm afraid um, we've, I've discussed this at length and I'm sure uh, many of you have with the CEO and we've looked at these issues. We're absolutely committed to fulfillment of all of our legal responsibilities and to doing a study in a relatively short period of time to decide where we want to go in terms of our advertising policy. Um, and as in many situations like this, um, 
this uh, vendor is free to put out anything they want to put out publicly, but we are not at liberty to discuss much of what needs to be said um, behind the scenes. And I, I think we just have to accept that's true. I'm sorry, this is continuing, uh, but we've got to do our work. And uh, I don't know if Julie wants to say any more, any board members want to, but I, I just think we have to go forward with this. Okay, Julie, you want to say something? I was just going to say thank you, Mr. Chair. I, mm -hmm. As you know, there's a this is a complex issue. There's a lot around it. My feelings around advertising aside, um, there is a, a large opportunity for us and a large risk to us that we are considering. This has been fully vetted through our legal attorney, and we are continuing to do things in a, a proactive way to try and address both the revenue issues as well as the legal issues associated with our policy. Okay, thanks. Anybody else? All right, thank you. Um, so um, it is my duty to report to you on the annual shareholders meeting of the uh, Greater Richmond Board of um, Greater Richmond Transit Company, which occurred on November 12th, 2021 at GRTC and occupied, I think, about three and a half minutes. Um, the city of, Richmond was <laughs> city of Richmond was represented by uh, City Council President, Dr. Cynthia Newbill in the County of Chesterfield was represented by County Administrator, Dr. Joseph Casey. And the city of Richmond reappointed uh, Benjamin Campbell, George Braxton and Elders Coles to the board. The County of Chesterfield um, nominated uh, Gary Armstrong, Ian Mulliken and Daniel Smith. Uh, these people were accepted by the meeting and their terms uh, will be held until October, 2022 unless something changes, Bonnie, and I have no idea how all that's gonna happen in terms of change in the board structure, but that's what, that's what the election is. Um, so uh, any questions about the board meeting? All right, well, we're all here. Um, so now uh, George Braxton is chair of the nominating committee for the GRTC Board of Directors Officers and Mr. Braxton, we need your report. Morning. Morning. Well, the nominating committee um, met uh, for a period that was uh, about the same time as the um, <laughs> board of uh, the other group. Um, well, I've reached out to members of the board, um, essentially the, uh, the current members to um, ask them about their interest in serving as we go forward into this new um, frontier where we're about to possibly see some changes in the structure of the board. Um, after discussing with them, they each uh, agreed to continue their service. So at this point, um, I move that um, the nominations be closed with the following members. Um, as office as a slate of officers for fiscal year 22 and that would be um, chairman benjamin campbell vice chair gary armstrong and secretary eldridge coles so uh i move that this be the slate of officers for the um, coming fiscal year all right is there a second to that second are there any further nominations all right, all in favor of these nominations being accepted um, and these officers being appointed to continue, uh, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? All righty, you lucky people. Uh, we're, we're right in here going forward. And- um, One more again. Yep. Um, and uh, Bonnie, let me just say, um, and I don't know who gets into this conversation, frankly, but it sure would be nice if we could, um, as we're redoing the bylaws, uh, do a three-year terms rotating rather than one-year terms where we, we actually um, don't know for real that there will be continuity in the board um, each year. Um, so one other thing, the, the meeting for December if we're following what we're doing at the moment would end up on the 21st of December, which puts us pretty close to Christmas. And I'm wondering if I can find any um, any interest among you in moving that back a week uh, earlier to the 14th. Um, what do you guys think in the, in the board? Staff can get the information 
you know, in time. And I know it's been a, what had was a challenge at some times, but um, it's fine with me. I, I, I don't, I don't want to play it all out in front of the world, but yeah, I, I would say just stick with that. Um, to the, to the 14th we, or the 21st? Um, the 21st, unless there specifically is an issue with vacation and staff, um, you know, just because of the time to, you know, us being off cycle in terms of the extra week or what have you. But unless there's a specific um, request of staff, um, I, I would I would stick with the date we have and then maybe um, have a, a shorter meeting. If I might, Mr. Chairman, go for it. Looking at my calendar, um, we do have uh, a lot of vacations planned for that week. We can certainly work around a board meeting. That is our first responsibility. I'm also um, wondering if there will be quorum of the board members, whether or not there's vacations planned for that as well. For the so are you saying from a staff point of view, it would be uh, just as convenient or maybe even helpful to move it? It's about a 50-50. Uh, since the moving it to the week prior would be the 14th, that does give us two full weeks to prepare um, for the meeting. Uh, having three full weeks is always easier for staff, especially with Thanksgiving uh, between now and then. But with the holidays, if the board finds it more convenient to move, we will adjust. If they find it more convenient to the 21st, we will adjust as well. It really is. Um, so I've heard Danny and George, um, Gary, Ian, and Eldridge. Any comments? Either works for me. 21st is slightly better for me, but I can I can move a meeting and make the 14th work. I have no problem with it. Sounds like we just stay there, uh, Julie. Okay. Thank you, sir. Uh-huh, thank you. All right, so now we have to uh, approve the, um, so we're gonna be on 21st. We're gonna stay on 21st. <coughs> we have the minutes of the previous meeting here, I think is the next deal, right? Um, so could I have a, a uh, motion to approve these minutes. No, no. Second, please. Mr. Chair, Mr. Chair well, I do please. have a, a potential change. Okay. Um, you know, we were talking about the advertising program last time. I made a, a um, adjustment in which was included in the motion to make sure that we had a discussion about this by January of of this next year. And I don't see that really, oh, excuse me. Make a recommendation no later than January 22nd board meeting. I'm sorry, I missed okay. that, I'm good. I know, I know we intend it, um, thanks. Is it in the minutes you say? It is in there. Okay, any other sorry, additions or corrections? That. All right, all in favor of approving the minutes say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? The minutes are approved um, as presented. Uh, and next is our financial administrative report uh, from our CFO, Mr. Zinzarella. Good morning, John. Good morning, Mr. Chairman and members of the board. I'm going to share my screen. Okay. All right. On the screen, you should see, which is uh, slide 12 in your deck. So, um, Moving over to slide 13, this is the source of funds for the month ended uh, for the year to date ended September 30, 2021. Down on the lower right hand corner, you'll see that versus a budget of 15.8 million, um, actual revenues of 13.5 million for a, for a unfavorable variance of 2.3 million. Um, primarily, it's in the federal funds, and the main driver of this variance is, um, you know, obviously federal funds are reimbursement based. Uh, as you'll see a couple slides further down in the presentation, operating expenses year to date through September are 1.24 million. So a good portion of this is due to favorable spending. Uh, the balance is uh, due to um, the uh, due to the 5307 uh, flexing of PM reimbursement. We haven't submitted anything, so no revenue has been recognized. Um, and contributing a little bit to this variance is also um, the calendarization of the fiscal 22 year budget. As you'll see later in the income statement, the budget was showing a surplus year to date of approximately 900,000 and we're, we're basically booking to break even. So combination of the, of the 
calendarization plus the uh, the favorable spending is what's really driving uh, the favor the unfavorable revenues uh, versus budget. So you're saying that in fact we may uh, we may have uh, a slightly reduced um, uh, receipts uh, due to um, to matching issues, but that most of the problem is uh, is just phasing. Yeah, I think I believe. Yeah, what, I believe what I will say with regards to the calendarization issue, which you'll see in the regular statement of income, it's you know, with the introduction of the CBTA revenue stream as well as uh, you know the programming of the 5307 and the CARES Act money. It's just it's how the how the buckets of money comes versus how it was calendarized. Obviously, if it's if in our our full calendarization showed us in a break even position, so. If the first quarter of the calendarization was showing fair, well, we will, we will this this uh, uh, the nine hundred thousand portion of this will erode back to on, on budget. It will be primarily just you know on the, relative to the favorable operating spending. So not not a concern at this point, but and continue to watch it as well as uh, as we have three months under our belt. Look look at our full year forecast to see if there's any any items to report upon. Okay, moving over to slide uh, uh, slide 16 this is the the operating expenses this is the summary in the uh, the board presentation matter so you can see it as opposed to the eye chart as you can see down here in the bottom of slide uh, 17 the budget was 14.89 million dollars versus uh, actual expenses of 13.6 generating the 1 million 243 favorable variance uh, which is contributing to the unfavorable revenue variance. Uh, for the spending uh, driven, a good chunk of it is in the labor variance. Uh, you know, vehicle operations is favorable to headcount positions uh, at the end of September by about 33 positions. Maintenance is favorable by about 14. So the labor variance, as you can understand, is, is, based, is based upon uh, unfilled positions, as well as you can see in the administration. So on the wage portion of the 200 and uh, of the 435, about 127,000 is in operators wages and salaries. And the other about $300,000 is in the other salaries and wages uh, for maintenance and administrative. And fringe benefits is just about uh, on, on budget. Um, looking further down on services, uh, this month it's unfavorable by about $119,000. It's primarily driven by the timing of uh, uh, expenses related to various planning and scheduling consulting projects. In addition, as you're aware, you've probably have seen on the on the television uh, a rather aggressive uh, recruiting campaign uh, to get operators and mechanics. So those bills have come in. This is uh, contemplated uh, in the budget uh, to be funded with uh, COVID relief dollars, uh, which it is. So that's just the way it hit this month was a large chunk of the invoices related to the advertising. Um, and you know, offsetting that is our, our contract maintenance uh, services driven by the building maintenance is favorable by 199,000, just timing of uh, expenditures relative to calendarization. Similarly, in materials and supplies, consume line favorable about $400,000 split between, you know, about half of it, a little more than half of it, fuel and lubricants and the balance between basically other equipment and tires and tubes. Sliding down further, um, others a note, the purchase transportation services is favorable by $256,000, and that's basically based upon demand. Uh, moving over to, uh, you know, slides, sl slide uh, 26 through 28 is basically the narrative pieces to look at the various components and different in presentations with regards to the operating expenses. Um, you'll see here, as I alluded to earlier, that on the head count, we're about 55 positions uh, favorable relative to the budget. Obviously, as you're aware, for the need of, 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 of filling of operators and mechanics uh, is about 47 of the 55 positions that are vacant, which is driving it. And as you can see, some of the favorable wages is offset um, with the uh, overtime. Overtime's around in the 7 to 10% range uh, based upon the area to ensure um, you know, manning the routes as well as having the vehicles ready for, to, to, be, to go out on the routes. Um, as I mentioned earlier, here's the statement of income. We're now on uh, slide 29. As you can see down here, I was talking about the calendarization. Down here, uh, 
the change in that position on the budget basis was showing about uh, nine hundred thousand dollars favorable. We are uh, slightly unfavorable, and this is due to the COVID, the, uh, COVID relief uh, funds for the month of September. We uh, did not file them for that month. So they were one hundred thirty-five thousand. They will be booked jointly in October with the funding. But as you can see, is uh, your net operating revenue is 2.3 million unfavorable, offset it by the favorable operating expenses net to approximately a million dollar um, deviation versus what the uh, budgeted fund position was. And that's, you know, calendarization aspect of it, which we're watching and we'll, we should turn around in the next two or two, two quarters. On the balance sheet, moving over to slide 30. Um, you know, what the trend here is continuing from year end and it's part of the business cycle as well as the strengthening of the balance sheet it is noticed by the cash position increasing um, from prior year end, uh, a little bit down from uh, the month of August. And that's basically, you know, as I mentioned previously, kind of our cash flow cycle with the funding, the CBT happening in the beginning of each quarter. And then the cash balance works down as we have expenditures. Um, accounts receivable line uh, down from year end and down from prior month. This is just basically the realization of the quarterly funding from um, uh, City of Richmond and, um, and RICO and uh, basically the month to month for Chesterfield, as well as any outstanding grants. Um, down here on the balance sheet, you can see the, uh, the other, the restricted funds for CBTA uh, up to 17.7 million, reflecting the continuation of uh, uh, receiving uh, sales and use and, and fuel excise tax from CBTA um, and, and as well as the offsetting deferred revenue portion for that. Um, basically, the comments look solid, uh, nothing, nothing to concerns at this point. Uh, moving over to slide 31 on our cash flow position. Um, as I mentioned previously, we're at the end of September, a balance of 1875 as expected. It's, you know, we're taking a, a cash, our, our, our pattern for cash is going to be high at the beginning of the quarter, going down to a lower point. And then as you can see from here, from the projections for October, with the funding of the CBTA quarterly, and as well as Richmond down in here, we will will hit a higher position expected at the end of October, and then it will work its way down towards the end of the year. No concerns here. Um, we're working to uh, efforts to crystallize this and, and be more accurate on our forecasting of this as well. Moving over to slide 32. This we we reviewed this at our at our August meeting for the data through September. This is the September CBTA quarterly report that was filed with CBTA um, in the beginning part of November. And you know, as a the call outs here, the ending balance uh, of funds that are available are 17.7 .7 million dollars. Um, and you know, on here, you can see the activity of the quarter for the receipts, uh, the interest uh, and, and uh, unrealized gain from the LGIP extended maturity account. And then the costs, we used about $46,000 in, in, in of, the, of these funds for uh, doing the GRTC Regional Public Transportation Plan for fiscal, starting for fiscal 23. And then this is our quarterly funding for both our uh, Q1 operating and CapEx. And, the majority of this balance is invested in the LGIP EM to uh, maximize investment income to for this account. Um, at that point, at this point, it's uh, you know I'll, I'll field any questions. So, uh, John and Julie, um, during the uh, recent gubernatorial campaign, the uh, Mr. Youngkin, who was elected governor, mentioned um, attempting to or the possible uh, attempt to um, delay the uh, uh, the imposition of tax on fuel does that does that affect us in the CBTA's funding? Do you have you all looked into that at all, Mr. Chairman? I haven't looked at uh, looked at that specifically. We would wait for guidance from DRPT. Um, I hate to assume um, assume, but what I suspect will happen is that. There are portions of the gas tax that are statewide, and there are portions of the gas tax that are dedicated by legislation to regional entities. Um, at this time, I would expect that the portion of the gas tax dedicated to regional entities would remain unchanged. It would be the statewide tax that would be under consideration by the governor and his staff. All right, thank you. <clears throat> Any further questions of, uh, of Mr. Zinzarella? 
Thank you, as always, for a very thorough report. Yeah. All right. Um, now what's coming up, we have um, procurements. Hi, Tanya. Hi, Ms. Thompson. Yes, sir. Good morning. How are morning. you? Great. Good morning, everyone. Procurements report can be found on pages 33 and 34 of your board packet. And I do have one update to share with you today. Our planning department has been working with Kimley Horn to plan the development of GRTC's new temporary transfer center to be located between Lee and Clay Streets in the city of Richmond. This winter, we hope to bring a recommendation to the board for a construct construction contract to develop the site with paving, lighting improvements, bus bays, signage, amenities, and other uh, necessary, um, excuse me, construction activity at the site. Um, staff's estimate for this project is roughly $2.7 million in this expenditure was approved in GRTC's FY22 budget. That is all of the update I have for you today. Are there any questions? Well, thank you. We're going to get something on that uh, transfer pause a little later, right, um, Julie? Um, yes, thanks, Todd. Any other questions on this procurement? Um, anything, nothing else we need to note that's not been there before, right? Yes, sir. Okay. Thank you. Um, the next uh, is an action item dealing with the audits. So I think... Um, Leslie Roberts is here today, right? Yes, sir. Hello. Nice hey, to see you. you. Good to see you, too. Thank you. I apologize. I'm in my daughter's basement. I'm helping her <laughs> with her with my newly born granddaughter here in Charlottesville. All right. You from her basement. Congratulations. <laughs> Thank yeah. you. Very excited. Um, uh, first off, in general, the audit went very well. Uh, we finished the audit last month. Uh, John and Don and everybody there were very helpful throughout the audit. They were ready for us. Our timeline was much um, quicker. We did everything a little bit earlier this year. And a little bit earlier. <laughs> this is wonderful to get the audit um, at this point in the year. I'd several a number of months before we've gotten it. Right. right yeah. Oh, exactly. That's great. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Maybe I. I, I um, didn't do it justice, but yes, everybody worked as a team, your team, mm. team to make this happen. And it is, it is a first to be finished up this early. So yes, this is great. Um, like I said, everybody was helpful throughout the audit and that includes planning. I mean, we did a lot of things earlier than we've done in the past in order to pull some of that work out of the traditional field work. So we were able to do that and that really helped us move it along. And during field work, everybody was available and, and during wrap up after we come out of the field and we've got a few open items and so forth that need to be um, resolved. That was that went very smoothly as well. Um, I told Julie when we when I came on this morning that I was going to go ahead and give my manager and my director a chance to be part of the presentation because you know how I love to talk about this stuff, but um, I'm trying to grow our management team. And as such, I'm going to have Danielle Nicolason, who has been your senior manager. She's recently been promoted to a director in the firm, which is the, net, the step before partner. And she'll be presenting your audited financial statements and Christy Turner who was, who was uh, promoted to manager a couple of years ago. She's been on your team for several years. Uh, we'll present the required correspondence to those in charge of governance. And I'll just be around to help answer any questions as things go along. Thank you. So, over the presentation to Danielle. Thank you, Leslie. Um, good morning, everybody. Good morning. Um, would it be appropriate for me to share the audit report, or do you all have that in front of you? We do have it. What What should we do okay. here, Joe? Um, it is uh, your preference whether you'd like it on the screen for those who weren't able to print out the 100-plus or 200-plus page board packet. We did include it in the board packet. Um, so sharing the screen might be useful for those who are watching us. I prefer it shared. Thank you, sir. Okay. 
I want to make sure I share the right thing. Okay. Okay, so um, page one of our audit report is the opinion. Um, first paragraph speaks to the audit of the basic financial statements as listed in the table of contents. And the audit covers the financials of GRTC and ride finders, which is um, considered to be a blended component unit of GRTC. Second page is our opinion. Um, financial statements referred um, to above present fairly in all material respects. This is a clean opinion, unmodified. Um, going on, we have um, a couple of additional paragraphs here. We make reference to note 18. There was a restatement to the financial statements that we'll talk about later on, but our opinion is not modified with respect to this matter. Um, further down, we address required supplementary information. Um, this consists of management's discussion and analysis, as well as the pension trend information. We apply limited procedures to this information, um, not enough to allow us to express an opinion on them, but they are um, tested in, in terms of our, our testing of the financial statements. Further down, we have other supplementary information. This consists of your schedule of expenditures of federal awards in which we issue an in relation to opinion. And um, that will be in a separate report at the back of the, um, the package. And then the last paragraph of our audit report makes reference to an additional <laughs> report. So we have three reports total um, that addresses our internal control over financial reporting and tests of compliance. So we'll go over those again. The first section of the financial statements after our audit report um, is the management's discussion and analysis. This includes the um, high level summarized current year and prior year financial information of GRTC and is just sort of a high level overview of these financial statements and their changes from year to year um, and also includes some detailed descriptions of the changes the drivers of the changes in the activity from year to year. And this is prepared by management and is a really good descriptive high level overview of what happened during the year and what the major changes were from, from last year. So the first page of our basic financial statements is the statement in that position that spans across two pages. Um, on the first page, we have your major assets and deferred outflows of resources. Your major assets here, cash, receivables, capital assets, and those are discussed further in notes three, four, and five for a deeper dive there. Um, and some significant items to note here, significant increase in cash, which on the next page we'll note is directly related to the funding from CBTA during FY21 that hadn't yet been spent. And also down here at the bottom, we have um, a change in the deferred outflows of resources related to the what was previously reported as an OPEB liability, which we'll talk about later on as um, a restatement. Second page of the statement of net position liabilities, deferred inflows of resources in net position. Um, the major liability, of course, for the for GRTC is the, the pension liability here which is discussed at note six. Um, and then down here, we also have the deferred revenue related to CBTA of 16 million. Page 14 or 11 of the financial statements is essentially starts the income statement, uh, which again spans across two pages. We'll note here that um, there was no passenger revenue that was discontinued towards the end of FY20 and all throughout FY21. And then towards the bottom, we'll see a significant increase in FTA funds, specifically those related to CARES funding and revenue insufficiencies. Following 
saying um, the income statement is the statement of cash flows. This is just an overall representation of where the, the cash of the GRTC was spent throughout the year. It's, it's pretty descriptive here. Um, the notes to the financial statements begin on page 15. Um, on page 18 starts the footnotes that I noted earlier um, regarding the significant assets of GRTC, cash, cash equivalents, receivables, and capital assets. So it just gives some more description and some more detail behind what's encompassed in those um, financial statement line items there. I think 21 begins the discussion of your retirement plan. Um, there's some pretty significant estimates embedded in the evaluation of your pension liability and the related deferred inflows and outflows. Um, these are all developed by the actuary. Um, so it just kind of goes into some more detail here. On page 29, um, there begins a disclosure regarding the other post-employment benefit plan liability. Um, and then there's further discussion of the restatement, um, which I'll actually skip right into. So on page 33, we have discussion of the restatement. Um, John, at the beginning of our audit, John sort of took a really hard look at the amounts that had been previously reported as the other post-employment benefit obligation. So this is the benefits provided to retirees that is not encompassed within the pension plan. And he sort of realized that the information that the actuaries had been using for many years had not necessarily been the most accurate. And so there was a hard look that was taken on that. And as such, or as a result of that reassessment, we have this summary down here at the bottom where Essentially, the OPEB liability and the related deferred amounts were removed. If, if there are any detailed questions about specific benefits outside of COBRA, um, I'm, <laughs> I'll let John field those. <laughs> but um, essentially, we had noted that the, the actuary report had been using um, incorrect data. And so we restated the financial statements to correct that as of the beginning of the year. And so this is the result of that correction. So this is a correction that results in a change of about $38 million, right? No, so no, the, re, the change is just the middle column here. So it would be the 1.6. Okay. The first column is the amounts as they I got it, I got it. And those amounts can be tied back and these are obligations outside the retirement plan for uh, people who have retired? Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. Yes, which at this point primarily just consists of the, the COBRA. Okay. Um, I did want to jump back to Page 30 um, begins the note disclosure regarding ride finders. Um, they, as I mentioned before, they are presented as a blended component unit within the GRTC financial statements. And so we have the breakdown here of ride finders versus GRC, GRTC standalone to get to the totals, which are reported in the basic financial statements. And ride finders is um, audited separately. They also have issued their own separate standalone statements. So the information here was derived from those separately audited financial statements. And then also I wanted to point out in terms of the notes on page 34 is a brief note regarding um, the CBTA funding um, and the rationale for the reflection as deferred revenue on the, the balance sheet. So it is kind of a new Pretty significant item for GRTC for FY21. Moving on is the required supplement, supplementary information. This is related to your pension plan. 
is just some trend information. Um, we're required to disclose 10 years of trend information. The GASB that implemented this happened in 2014, so we'll continue to build until there's 10 years of trend information here. The second of our reports that we issued, the second of three, um, is our report on internal control over financial reporting and on compliance. And this is issued for any audit performed in accordance with government auditing standards. Um, at the bottom here, we note that um, we considered GRTC's internal controls over financial reporting as a basis for designing our audit procedures. Um, based on this consideration of internal control, we did not identify any deficiencies that um, are required to be reported to you um, here. And then also at the top of page 44, we note that as uh, we noted no instances of non-compliance as a result of our testing of uh, compliance tests. And our third report is our uniform guidance report on our single audit. So this is our audit of your federal expenditures. And at the bottom, you'll see here, in our opinion, you have complied in all material respects. So there were no compliance findings as a result of our testing of your federal expenditures. And then also on the following page is our report on internal controls over compliance. So we also are required to test your internal controls um, of your federal awards expenditures. And there were no um, deficiencies noted there as a result of our testing. And then this is a summary of specifically of your federal expenditures by program. And the schedule here on the back of findings and question costs. So this is essentially a big picture summary of our results. Unmodified opinion on the financial statements, no deficiencies, no instances of non-compliance. Um, the federal programs that we tested as major, which was all of them, um, because they all fall under the, the same federal transit cluster. And then if there were findings, they would be reported here. And at this time, I will reach out for any questions that y'all might have before I turn it over to Christy for the um, required correspondence. Any questions? Thank you very much for this work. Thank you. Um, yeah. We'll stop sharing and I will turn it over to Christy. Good morning. So I'll be presenting the letter that we provide to use the board at the end of the audit. I will go ahead and share my screen so that you all can see it. Um, can everyone see this PDF that's on my desktop? Yep. So um, just as a statement, this letter has a lot of boiler template standardized terms in it and wording, but I'm just going to cover the high level stuff for you all. So we're not going over every page of this letter. The first part I want to point out is the contact page. So this lists my information, Leslie's information and Danielle's information in terms of email address and phone numbers in case if you all needed to reach out to us after this presentation or maybe, you know, you have a question come up during the year, please feel free to reach out. Okay, so this is the actual, begins the letter that we give to you as the board after we finish the audit. And the first part that I want to point out is this very first paragraph under the qualitative aspects of accounting practices. Essentially, this paragraph highlights whether there are any new accounting standards that we had to implement this year. And for 2021, there were no new accounting standards. So everything should be similar to last year in terms of accounting policies. The next section, we want to point out the accounting estimates that we think are particularly most sensitive to the financial statements and to bring them to your attention. And these include the pension liability and those related deferred inflows and outflows that are presented on the equivalent, basically the balance sheet for DRTC, the useful life of capital assets and the accrued uninsured accident claims. And it gives a little bit more information as to how management comes up with these estimates. So then if we skip down into the next section, this section here highlights the financial statement 
footnote disclosures that we think are particularly sensitive to the financial statements. And just to highlight those for you all, it's the retirement plan, which is note six, the accrued uninsured accident claim note in number seven, the union contract in note number 11, and then the commitment and contingencies in note 14. Then if we skip down to the next section, which is the difficulties encountered in performing the audit, we're pleased to report that there were no difficulties. If there had been, you would have heard from us sooner than at this presentation. Then we go down to the corrected and uncorrected misstatements. In this section, we're basically saying that there were no uncorrected misstatements and those corrected misstatements are our typical audit adjustments you can find in Appendix B of this letter. And then if we go down to the next section, disagreements with management, Yet again, we're happy to report that there were no disagreements with management. If there had been, you would have heard from us far sooner than this presentation. And then the next section just highlights the management representation and refers to Appendix A. This is the letter that we get from management. After the audit, just them saying, hey, we've provided you with all the information that you've requested. We've made you aware of anything that you know we're aware of and we've been forthcoming with all of our responses. And then if we scroll down to the very last section, the other matters, this just highlights the management discussion analysis, as well as the required supplementary information, just to reiterate that we did not audit them, but we performed some limited procedures over those, sec over those parts of the financial statements. And then the very next paragraph also highlights yet again, the schedule of expenditures of federal awards and just kind of touches upon what we did, such as making sure to inquire of management, um, evaluating the form content of the schedule, making sure the accounting principles didn't change from last year, and then also reconciling the information in, the, in that schedule back to either underlying accounting records or to the financial statements themselves. Are there any questions over the letter before I move on to the next section? Okay. So then the very last section just to cover, this is just covering new GASB from announcements that are coming up. And you can probably tell it's quite lengthy, so I'm not gonna go into detail, but we just wanted to provide this for your, just as for your information, just to make you aware of the new standards that are coming and on the horizon that could impact ERTC in years to come. So that is it for the letter. Are there any questions? So that's a clean, a clean letter and a clean opinion for us, correct? Yes. Mm -hmm. Great. Cleanest I've ever seen. What'd you say, Denny? It seems to be the cleanest I've ever, I've ever seen so far. Yeah, it does, doesn't it? It's wonderful. All right, is that it? Um, yeah, just one comment that is correct. I think this is the first time we've had no findings on financial <laughs> reporting or on compliance or any other matters. So, yeah, this is the cleanest that it's been in our tenure with you. Yeah. We are grateful for your work. And um, obviously, um, I think all of us are grateful to our management and, uh, and staff <clears throat> for getting their work in a position that they can receive this kind of opinion. Uh, any further questions? I think then we're just going to have a motion to accept this um, this report as presented. Have some move. Second. All right. It's been moved and seconded that the board of directors accepts uh, the audit of um, of this last year uh, as presented. All in favor, say aye. 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 All opposed. All right, it's done. And thank you so much, folks, for uh, for your detailed work. Um, you know, I'm just a, I'm just a preacher. So I need I need to know that somebody else is checking the numbers on us. <laughs> and, and I'm um, very you, grateful for this. Yes, Mr. Julie. Chair, if mm -hmm. I may, um, to a question for the auditors. We did put on the report that you would be put our report on ride finders and GRTC. Does this report actually uh, cover both of those or do we need to have a separate report up for ride finders? Well, um, essentially ride finders is a blended component unit of GRTC. So those numbers that we went over and the disclosures also include numbers for, where, where relevant of ride finders. Um, I just want to make sure that we have the board has a 
that the, the motion was to adopt GRTC, that that would also cover, maybe this is an attorney question, that this does cover both ride finders and GRTC for their acceptance of these reports. Um, yeah, it's my understanding that it did, um, unless there's some question someone else wants to raise on that. I know in, in uh, last year we did these as two separate and I, I know. would be pleased for this to yeah. be a single one. Just want to make sure that we're, we're good legally so that that actually did cover both of them and that we can move on. Bonnie, she's asking you. I think that um, you certainly could clarify if you'd like that you've received both audits. It, it sounds like it's pretty clear that you have based on Leslie's guidance. Danny, give me a motion. I should move. <laughs> it's been moved and second, please. Second. It's been moved and seconded that uh, we intend to approve this consolidated report, blended report, uh, which includes ride finders in the GRTC audit report. All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed? No. Thank you very much for your work, folks. Thank you. And for the timeliness of it. It's wonderful. Thank you. Mm -hmm. It's a testament to management's dedication. Great. Take care. All right. Um, you are free. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thank you um, so go much. Go back to your grandchild. That's wonderful. That's what I'm going to do. She was crying <laughs> during this. <laughs> okay. All right. Take care. Okay. All right. So um, next we have, um, have yes. Uh, Mr. Coles has a question. Yeah, Eldridge. Uh, yeah, I, I, I would like to uh, hear from the uh, actuary for the pension. Uh, I know that uh, sometime we had the actuary come in and give us the help of the... Uh, of the Thank you. If I can restate that, Mr. Campbell, that was uh, very hard to hear, but I believe that Mr. Coles is asking for the board to receive a report from the actuary regarding the pension. I know that Mr. Zinzarella has been going through some of the details of that. We don't have that ready to report today, um, but we could certainly bring that forward at a, at a future meeting to go through. There have been considerations and discussions about the ongoing net liability. We did try and address a significant portion of that in our last union contract. However, that did not go into effect until a very late in last fiscal year. So what we put into place, I wouldn't expect to start seeing some of the improvements until next fiscal, fiscal year. However, I, um, at the board's pleasure, we can certainly bring in some more information on that and an update. Yeah, please do. I was thinking the same thing. That was pretty serious when we looked at it earlier. Thanks, Eldridge. Um, so would you guys um, check that out and give us a good report on, the, on where we are with the pension liability as yes, we sir. move forward? Yeah. Thank you. Any further comment, question? Alrighty, that's um, that's done. Thank you, uh, and thank you, Ms. Roberts. Um, so now we move. I don't think Adrian's here. Is Adrian here? No, she's on. Uh, no, no, this is just her department. Right. But so okay. We'll move on directly. So Carrie. Good morning, Mr. Chair. And before I begin, I'll give you all a heads up. Sometimes the first time I screen share, there might be a slight lag. Uh, so please bear with me while I am beginning to share my screen with you all. In partnership with the University of Richmond, GRTC's Transit History Museum is being updated with a new installation featuring new GRTC family faces and stories gathered this fall through a series of history harvests. The private opening of the museum is tomorrow evening at GRTC's headquarters. And unfortunately, it is by invitation only because of COVID protocols. So we are not yet able to open to the public. But, and I believe you should now be able to see my screen, there is a virtual experience with all the same images and narratives that are housed there. Now, this is a first look. The students have been working very hard on this platform and this is the first time that these portraits have been shared. These are all GRTC family members, whether they are current employees, retirees, relatives, or descendants of GRTC family who have been with the company over the years. And I'm just so excited for this 
uh, new installation, which will be happening later today. The University of Richmond students in the public transportation in the time of two pandemics course gathered oral histories from these GRTC employees and in some cases their family members. These are photographs by Tanya Del Carmen and the series is called Through It All, Families Moving Richmond. It shines a light on GRTC employees and relatives who keep GRTC operational and lead Richmond through unprecedented times. Stories of GRTC families reflect resilience, strength, work ethic, and so much more. The new exhibit is being installed today in the hallway on 2R and invited guests will explore the museum Wednesday evening, but this virtual experience is available at fightforknowledge.org, which is the class website. I also want to acknowledge and thank Ashley Mason for her excellent work coordinating with the University of Richmond on this project. She'll be overseeing the installation today. Mr. Chair, this concludes my report. Thank you, Carrie. Uh, any questions about this? This is quite a, a thing, and, this, and I know the, uh, the students and the folks at U of R have just really loved being doing this and have, have um, are all pretty impressed by the, by the quality of, of our um, folks who work at GRTC, the families, uh, the, uh, the spirit of the people who, uh, who um, make this system work. And so I hope you'll, uh, you'll all come to the opening of this. And um, I think this is a really good step. But um, are, there, are there questions about it? Um, on Thursday, the, um, we do have a, uh, this part of this transit talk series that RVA Rapid Transit is doing is going to uh, talk uh, positively uh, looking at our drivers and, uh, and mechanics at our staff in general. So uh, if you can get on that, please do look up RVA Rapid Transit um, on the web and uh, sign in for that from noon to one on Thursday. Thank you very much. Now we have an annual report from, what is this annual report? <laughs> Mary, what do you got? Okay, good morning, Mr. Chair again. Each year, the marketing department prepares the GRTC annual report for the public and we post it on rodgrtc.com. So once again, please bear with me in case there is a slight lag in my computer accepting the screen share. This digital document provides an executive summary of company activities and accomplishments during the last fiscal year. And we are now doing it entirely built into the website. Uh, we have focused on the faces including your own with the GRTC Board of Directors. You went over that real uh, okay. quickly, uh, Carrie. That was the prettiest part of the report. It sure was. Let me, let me do it in slow motion. Bing, you're too kind. <laughs> <laughs> I thought it was a good picture as well. <laughs> there okay. is both the online experience where you can click through as well as explore more data. Uh, we've tried to incorporate infographics to highlight some of the key st uh, statistics. Uh, celebrate members of the GRTC family and their accomplishments during the year. I won't scroll through all of it, but there is also a downloadable option uh, in a PDF format. So there's, there's still a more traditional uh, annual report format that people can have access to. Some of these individual pages also serve as really helpful uh, takeaway cheat sheets for information about our riders, our ridership, and our financials. Uh, we were also able to incorporate quotations from real writers in portions of the report. So we're really pleased with that. Uh, this annual report is mostly used as a quick reference for stakeholders, media, and the public. And it is now live on ridegrtc.com along with all of our annual reports that have been digitally posted. So you can still see both past and current reports. And this concludes my report, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Thank you so much for doing that work. Are there any questions? Comments? I, I do have a comment, Mr. Chair. Um, I did want to put a shout out to an employee of ours who just decided um, he's moved on to greener pastures. We're always excited when people are able to move on with their careers, but we're also sad when they leave us. Tyler in our graphics department was instrumental 
in really reformatting how we present this in the past. Our annual reports have been very, very long, very text heavy, and this is definitely more user friendly and allows people to get in, get quick information and move on. So we, we appreciate his hard work and we wish him well in his career. Thank you. Thank you, Tyler. All right, um, City of Richmond property lease for temporary transfer center. How about that? Good morning, everyone. Good morning, Mr. Shepard. Um, just let me know if you guys can see the presentation on your side. Yes. Perfect. All right, so today I will be sharing some highlights of our temporary transfer center lease agreement. But before I do, I'd like to briefly explain how we got to this point. Um, the lease agreement came about um, after I shared the um, concept design during the July board meeting. From there, um, it went through urban design committee review and then on to planning commission review. Um, one of the concerns during the planning commission review was the temporary use of the transfer center. So an ordinance was introduced to and adopted by city council to authorize the chief administrative officer to enter into a lease agreement with GRTC for the parking lot located at 808 East Clay Street. So let's jump into the highlights of that lease agreement. <clears throat> the lease agreement created for use of eighth and clay of the eighth and clay site include rent, which is $1 per year. The five-year term was submitted as part of the FTA grant application based on pavement useful life of two to five years. This time frame could be shortened with the termination clauses. There are two termination clauses, one being the termination upon sale. Um, if the lot is sold, the city of Richmond would be providing GRTC a 12 month written notice of such sale and termination uh, before vacating. Or option two would be the termination upon the construction of a permanent transfer center station. Uh, more specifically, with the termination upon the construction of the permanent transfer center, um, upon the commencement of a passenger, a passenger service operation um, after the completion of the construction then the lease will terminate. Additional highlights include adjacent parking. Um, as you can see in, um, in the green border, the, uh, there are 34 parking spaces. There would be 34 parking spaces available for the judges. Um, um, part of the agreement includes pedestrian access um, there from the uh, public right of way. So through the adjacent parking lot, um, pedestrians can access the transfer center, which is um, surrounding the yellow border, uh, using the sidewalk and crosswalks with the ADA um, accessible curb ramps to the bus bays. Um, additional infrastructure improvements include the pavement and lighting. Um, part of the lease agreement also um, addresses the installation of signage and advertising the construction of the 12 sawtooth um, bus bays, and then the passenger infrastructure, which is the um, public, I mean, the bus shelters, trash cans, and benches. Um, That's pretty quick. That was a uh, brief highlights of some of the key points on the lease agreement. If there are any questions, this concludes my presentation. This is quite an achievement. Um, the, um, you know, the temporary transfer plaza that we had <clears throat> began to feel not temporary and, and uh, was not, and its amenities were always a significant problem. Do we have any idea uh, when we're gonna be kicked out of the present uh, plaza and when this new one will be available for use. So as of as of now, the latest information that we have is we are going to be displaced from 9th Street, the bus space that we have, the six bus space that we have on 9th Street, um, mid-January 2022. Um, 
it would be ideal to push that back a little bit further with the information that we have now that's that's the latest that we have so um if when that does occur we do have an interim solution to um, place those not uh, the six bus bays that are no longer going to be allowed on the ninth street in front of the on ninth street in front of the public safety building we do have um a layout or surrounding the 808 parking lot and um, when do we think we'll have our new facility available um with the updated timeline um we're looking at summer 2022 for completion okay. And if I if I might add to that, there's there are I wish I could give and I wish we could give a, a definitive answer on exactly when we, we will be in there, but as we will go through procurement and construction over the next several months, um, that we do have some factors that are outside of our control. We know that the construction industry right now uh, is is very hot. Um, because our project is relatively small, we might not see as many bidders as we want, the prices might be high. If we have a severe weather, that could also impact our ability to lay concrete and have it cure properly. So um, those things being outside of our control, we hesitate to give a firm date of when we'll be in there, but we will be working very digital, diligently with procurement and our partners to get everything advanced as quickly as possible, um, noting those key issues. And we do have a, <clears throat> we do have a comfort station uh, restrooms for our uh, drivers, correct, on the site? That is correct. Yeah. Any further questions? Golly, um, you know, I guess a lot of y'all know what, what this journey has been like. And um, I know it was here before I started on the board. So congratulations on getting to at least a temporary um, plaza that has good facilities and uh, a 12 month um, barrier to uh, to being uh, displaced from it. And thank you hey, very ben. much. Yes. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I, I can't help but comment. We I do appreciate this. But what I heard was we're getting kicked out. We got to do something temporary, temporary to to handle our riders transfer needs. And, you know, ever since I've been on the board for 10 years, this has been a topic. We've gotten absolutely nowhere on a location, and you know we've been pushing this rock up the mountain, and it's somehow we have got to figure out our permanent deal on this. And you know, I, I just, I just feel like there's a total disservice to our to our ridership that we've not been able to work out something with the city to for a location, and so. You know, and the longer this goes on, I think the harder it is as the city continues to develop all its empty spots. Um, I don't, I don't know. It feels like we need a severe task force on this to get something done. So I'm, I'm throwing that out there as, as something that I would love to see staff in the city work towards to, to add some urgency around finding a permanent solution. If, if I might respond to that, Mr. Chair. Go ahead. So. You're absolutely right. When uh, I presented on this issue to the city council a little over a year ago, they immediately asked their staff to work with us to bring a task force together to look at a permanent solution. Um, we started that process and we were looking at properties when the sale of the public safety uh, property occurred and that process was stalled while we quickly uh, worked, our team worked to pivot for this new temporary. We are going to be reinstituting that. Uh, Dirona with the city of Richmond is always is already working with us very closely to get that permanent group, or the, the group for the permanent center back together so we can have that stakeholder interaction. We'll also be launching here in the next several months or so, the North-South BRT study, which we believe between the task force for a permanent location as well as the North-South study and a review of other considerations for where our service is live within the next year, two years, three years, looking at those intersections of needs for transit should help us narrow down. Uh, of course, as I mentioned to city council and I mentioned to this team before, we need a champion outside of GRTC to raise the, this cause and uh, the community to come together to highlight the very significant need to support our riders and the citizens that use transit. 
Okay, well, that's the, that's the big picture. Um, I, I must say that uh, this is the first success we've had at any transfer center. Um, and uh, I think it's gonna help us because it's going to actually uh, show the value, uh, give an indication of what can be done and uh, at least um, uh, make, us, make us more visible. But you're right, we have not got the real solution present yet. Um, thank you. And uh, Mr. Shepard, uh, thanks for your work. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any further questions on the transfer center? Um, City of Richmond property lease, do we have to approve that? We, no, we've got it, right? No, sir. Uh, since it's a one dollar lease per, right. it is. It's within my authority since there's no financial okay. burden, and you will also be approving the construction project, and you have been approving the studies moving forward. Um, the the proper board approvals have been and will continue to be in place to make sure that we move effectively. But it um, looks like we've got to do something on the transit asset management plan, um, don't we? Yes, sir. Go ahead. Yes. Yeah. And now I'll, I'll jump into that. That can be found on page 152 in your package. Um, so transit asset management, the transit asset manager plan describes current state of asset management at GRTC and makes recommendations for improvements to allow GRTC to provide safe, reliable, and high quality service to the region. Our first transit asset management plan was published in 2018. The updates to our plan are due October, 2022. Um, part of doing the update, it's just the opportunity to improve our processes overall through data collection, alignment with other, sorry, should I have been sharing this? Sorry about that. Yes. All right. Here we go. Sorry about that. <clears throat> um, again, part of the uh, TAM plan update is providing is just giving the agency an opportunity to improve our um, asset management processes, and that would be through data collection, alignment with other agency and regional priorities, uh, new and revised agency goals. This allows us to also incorporate new and updated information including investment prioritization criteria, new safety procedures or capital plans, and updated transit asset management or state of good repair policies. This will be funded with existing and existing and approved federal, state, and local funding. GRTC has provided a scope of work and requests for proposals from two consultants under the DRPT contract. GRTC has received one proposal back from Kimley Horn. After a review of the proposal, Kimley Horn was determined to be responsive and satisfied the scope of work with their approach. Total expenditures for these services to not exceed $110,000, which includes a contingency of $8,885. The staff recommends that the board of directors authorize the CEO to contract with Kimley Horn for professional services to up in the amount of $101,115 to update our 2018 transit asset management plan. Thank you. Is there, Mr. Uh, Chair, yes. Before, before you make a motion, um, I apologize, McGregor, this is where you're sharing the old report. The actual recommendation would be that you authorize the CEO to enter into a contract with a not to exceed value of 110,000 to allow for that contingency, the contract itself would be in the, um, the 101 value, but that would allow us a, a ability to flex if we find things moving and that need to be added, um, added. So the motion would actually be to approve a not to exceed amount of $110,000. All right, um, this is required by, we, the plan is required by the FTA, right? Yes, sir. Yeah, okay. Do I have a motion to approve this? So moved. Is there a second? Second. It's been moved and seconded that we approve a contract uh, uh, allowing the CEO to enter into a contract for a transit and uh, 
asset management plan not to exceed $110,000. Um, is there any further discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? It's passed. Thank you very much. Thanks, Mr. Shepard, again. Thank you. Um, Ms. Gross Pace. Good morning, and I will need to uh, hijack the screen share. Thank you very much. Okay, stand by while I get our screen share going. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Mm -hmm. GRTC continues to aggressively recruit and hire new bus operators and mechanics. We're using a variety of tactics, including through local media outlets and digital marketing partners. Combined with internal process changes like the on-site CDL testing from the DMV, continuously rolling training, and new hire sign-on bonuses, GRTC's marketing efforts have both increased the number of applicant visits to RideGRTC.com and delivered new hires directly attributed to our marketing <coughs> efforts. This is just a quick sample of some of the digital and print advertisements that we have been using. Many of you have seen our television ads as well. Uh, you can see that with our latest updates, we're including time sensitive and timely information like the sign on bonuses for operators and mechanics, as well as the recent update to the training and base pay uh, as of October 1st and incorporating more of the community impact that our employees have in, in serving the greater Richmond community. Web traffic has increased. You can see in our Google Analytics, the little spikes in web traffic to the employment page, which is exclusively where people can apply to work at GRTC. And we've been getting better at our tactics over time. You can see how those spikes have been over time increasing and getting higher and higher as we get smarter uh, with how we need to target people using these, these digital outlets. But I think the most exciting data that we have as of this year is that we have 17 new hires who are directly attributed to our marketing leads in 2021. Six of those operators remembered seeing TV ads and referencing them as the reason why they came to apply. Eight operators and one mechanic from our website and digital redirect efforts and one operator and one mechanic from our social media and Facebook jobs advertisements. So far this fiscal year, we have worked toward $400,000, which is on track to be expended by the end of this month. And that we also have previously approved by the board uh, on June 15th, the federal relief funding uses for Cinemedia. That's $10,000. That's the only amount that will have not been expended after this month. It was always scheduled to be spent in spring. We've been waiting for the movie theater attendance to increase. Uh, but now we're looking at what we think we need to do based on the successes that we've had, especially since August, and continuing to keep us in the awareness as an employer of choice while we are working through our labor shortages at this time. And we want to spend the dollars that we have available from federal relief funds prudently. So we are only recommending that we continue to work with partners that we have had proven success with so far. So what you're going to see outlined in the coming slides are familiar partners, partners that we've brought before you since we began this now hiring campaign in 2019. For NBC 12, uh, we are recommending to expend another $320,000 from December of 21 through June of 2022. Uh, however, these are going to be not to exceed amounts. And should we reach our necessary staffing levels before June of 22, then the CEO may, of course, direct staff uh, to conclude the media buys at, at that time. CBS 6, $294,950. WRIC 8, which is the ABC local affiliate, $254,635. Fox 35 at $160,525. Work for, that's the Facebook Jobs Board. They send daily leads to our recruiter and human resources. Another $20,000. It's a really modest spend for a really big impact in, in turning leads to our application page. And then we're also recommending a contingency budget be available just in case. Uh, we do need to revise our tactics uh, throughout this time period of December to June. Uh, last month in October, the board approved the fund support usage from these federal sources. The ARPA federal relief funds will be used for the purpose of ongoing recruitment efforts. 
I'm not going to read all of this, but I do want to put it up on screen, both for members of the board to refresh memory about what each media partner provides for us with these purchases and how we split our budget with each media partner. We're trying to balance both on-air broadcast resources as well as digital opportunities. And we do target, you'll see as I go through these slides, local news, uh, high profile broadcast opportunities, especially sports, uh, as well as the Olympics, which are coming up for the winter uh, season. This is channel six. You'll see very similar resources and balance of our budget for both TV and digital. Uh, channel eight, uh, we do not always get to partner with channel eight, but we do recommend that we bring them in for this uh, period of advertising because they also have some high profile sports opportunities coming up uh, and some digital resources that are non-skippable. Fox 35 is our only TV partner that we exclusively do television advertisements with. And once again, they are competitive in the sports realm and they also have a 10 p.m. newscast, which uh, can attract a slightly different audience that goes to bed a little bit earlier at night. A work for exclusively online with a daily lead list sent to human resources. So the new media buy plan, just to reiterate, this will be for the period of December 21 through June of 22 and not to exceed amounts as we've just outlined for each media partner. And the recommendation is that the board of directors authorizes the CEO to execute purchase orders not to exceed a total value of $1,150,110 for the period between December 1st, 2021 through June 30th, 2022 from ARPA federal relief funds for the purpose of ongoing recruitment efforts. And this concludes my report, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Would someone make that motion, please? So moved. A second, please. Second. All right, it's been moved and seconded. The board authorizes the CEO <laughs> to execute purchase orders not to exceed 1.150 uh, million for the period between December 1st and June 30th uh, from ARPA federal relief funds for the purpose of ongoing recruitment efforts. Is there any further discussion of this? Um, this is our responsible act in relationship to the shortage of drivers and mechanics that, and uh, I'm happy to hear that there's some good response going. This is a great place to work, folks, and we want to make sure it is for you. Um, so please apply. All in favor, any further discussion? Uh, just one thing. I just want to say I, I, I've seen some of the ads. I, I think they're just um, well done, um, really captures the, you know, the spirit um, that we want to present um, for GRTC. And um, just want to applaud the staff on that. Thank you. I feel the same way. Eldridge. Yes, I had uh, suggested uh, maybe a couple of meetings back that we have three or 400 uh, employees and I had suggested that they receive cards with their names on it where they could print their names on it and hand out the friends and relatives and anyone that they come in contact with about applying for positions at GRTC and they would be rewarded if that person come in and uh, be recruited for employment with us that the operator would uh, operate or, right. or the employee would receive a bonus of maybe hundred bucks or whatever. Julie, what do you got on that? Yes, sir. So we have, um, we do have a structure in place now where if uh, an operator or a mechanic or anyone's staff does recommend someone, there are bonuses of, of a, a couple hundred dollars that they can receive with that, that, that method. However, Mr. Coles is right. You did mention to me about a couple of weeks ago, the idea about giving a business card like, um, like, like card to our, our staff so that when someone comes in, if they give it out and they come in, it makes that direct connection versus relying on the new hires to remember who it was that um, that recruited them. And so, I I believe that I didn't I don't believe I've passed that information along to Miss Rose Pace. My apologies, Mr. Coles. But now that it is passed along, Carrie, let's try and make that happen. All right, great. Thanks. Thanks. Good idea. Any further comments or questions here before we vote? 
All right, voting to uh, to approve this uh, expenditure not to exceed 1.150 million. All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed? No, there are no opposed. So that's passed. Thank you very much. Good work. Thank you, Mr. Chair. All right, uh, Ms. Adams, uh, Operations and Maintenance Report. Good morning, Mr. Chair and board members. Good morning. Members. We will start the Operations and Maintenance Report with Mr. Tim Firm pre presenting the operating performance for the month of October. Thank you, Cheryl. And good morning, um, good morning. Chair and members of the board. Uh, I wanted to kind of piggyback on what Carrie uh, had just uh, reported and, and submitted as far as the media buys go. Uh, I will say that for the key performance indicators, which are located starting on page 162 of the board packet, uh, basically our uh, data over the past month has, has remained uh, constant uh, as compared to the prior months. Uh, just a little quick note that with the uh, lost trips, we did go down slightly uh, from last month down to 1670. Uh, and customer complaints, valid complaints went down from 64 to 46. So slight improvement in those areas. And, and like I said, most of the information is there on your board packet. But what I wanted to spend my time uh, talking about this morning is uh, to basically go over uh, where we are from a staffing standpoint, uh, how the fruits of our labor uh, that Carrie had mentioned uh, have paid off at least up until now uh, what are we doing to adjust uh, from an operational uh, standpoint and scheduling and planning uh, as we move forward? So right now we're at 250 full-time and 20 part-time operators. Uh, so we are continually, as Carrie mentioned, with the uh, uh, efforts of advertising, recruiting, uh, and so forth. We currently have 10 uh, operators uh, that are still in training. I mentioned that last month. Uh, they started on October the 26th. Uh, and the feedback that I've been getting from the training department uh, is that, you know, this is a good group of people. Uh, and like I said, this is the first double digit class that we've had uh, since the start of the pandemic. Uh, we are planning on having another class before the end of the year uh, to start uh, so that we will continue with this positive momentum uh, going forward. Because uh, we see still that we have a ways to go uh, in terms of uh, how we're operating uh, and so forth. So uh, as it was mentioned uh, in, in last month's meeting uh, with the service uh, reductions that we're gonna move forward with uh, that'll take place with the next booking on October the 19th, uh, the number of runs uh, that we have, our regular runs uh, have been or will be reduced from 215 to 202 uh, with fewer open trippers. Uh, that'll get us more in line with our current staffing level, levels. Uh, and we're also looking at a pilot program uh, that help augment uh, those uh, sh uh, those shortages in terms of those uh, that service during critical times of the early morning, late night, uh, which I'll talk about uh, later uh, this meeting. Uh, we also have new equipment. Uh, you know, we you know we've had challenges on the maintenance side as well, having available equipment uh, during our peak pullout periods. Uh, but we have new equipment that's uh, that's arriving uh, on both paratransit and on the fixed route side. Uh, as we get those vehicles ready uh, with electronics equipment, camera you know, installation in particular, uh, those will be hitting the streets in the next few weeks. So with a combination of what we've added with uh, new equipment, along with uh, the new operators uh, and mechanics, uh, hopefully we'll start seeing those dividends pay off here uh, and we'll see some of those KPI numbers uh, move into a more positive direction. Uh, because we're still lo looking closely uh, at the uh, vaccination rate. Uh, we're currently uh, about 77% uh, company-wide, 76% uh, of our operators uh, have been vaccinated and about 70% of our mechanics. So still a little work to go there. Uh, and as we move forward, you know, we want to make sure that we have, uh, you know, proper uh, ways to which make sure we're addressing whatever shortages we may anticipate with that as well. Uh, so we're watching that closely, still encouraging people uh, to get vaccinated. And, and we've had uh, some positive uh, results as far as people at least getting the first shot uh, you know, administered. So unless there are any questions or comments, uh, that concludes my report. You got new buses? Yes, yes, we have several. I think about 15 uh, of the cutoff and 15 of the fixed route buses. And our Pulse 
bus uh, that was uh, destroyed in the fire has arrived as well. So they'll be hitting the street here over the next few weeks. Okay, great. Any further questions? Thanks, uh, Mr. Barham. Uh, Ms. Robinson, I think, ridership performance, right? Yes, good morning. Good morning. Share my screen here. So I just wanted to go over the monthly ridership report for October 2021. So just looking down at the total fixed route number, we were at 753,072 riders. When we look at row seven, just focusing in on the local fixed route, we had 590,676. This is an increase of 4.9% from September an increase of 6.4% from October of 2020, and within half a percentage point from our October 2019 uh, pre-COVID numbers. Going back and looking at our month over month trends in column G, we can see an upward trend in ridership across all, um, all of our route types and categories with the exception of express routes, but I did just wanna remind the group that this negative trend that we're seeing is also partly due to the express route consolidation and end of reporting that happened mid-September. So we're still seeing that reflected in our numbers here. Um, this is a fairly short report this month, but I'd be happy to leave this on the screen as long as anyone needs to look over the numbers and answer any questions. Mr. Chairman, if I might add to this. Yep. Um, last week, I, I think the board knows that I was at the AFTA conference, the American Public Transportation Association, that every three years they have an expo and um, where we learn a lot about what's going on in the industry and are able to, to talk directly with other CEOs and staff. While I was there, AFTA did a, a study of how transit agencies across the country are handling COVID and the ridership issues associated with it. GRTC was one of five agencies highlighted in that study. And the results that came out really showed that GRTC is leading the industry in recovery of our local bus routes, um, which is very surprising to many of the industry. The two things that have been were highlighted in the study as the cause of this dramatic recovery. Um, one was because of the advanced thinking of GRTC in the city of Richmond and the region and the redesign and the implementation of the Pulse in 2018, that that realignment of our service connected people in our communities to jobs before we were calling them essential workforce and essential jobs. And that primed us for keeping our service levels high and our ridership high. And the second that was called out was the zero fares, which allowed those same workers to continue to ride and have additional access to critical essential resources. Um, this is being highlighted across the country as a national success. And I really want to applaud this board, this team, for the actions that were done prior to my tenure and their ongoing hard work to support our riders. Yeah, so you're at the APTA conference. This is a national conference. I, it is very exciting um, and, um, and significant. Shows also uh, how, how much we are a part of the healthy fabric of the community. And if I understand this correctly, uh, on our fixed route service, local fixed route service, we are within a half a percent of, of our pre-COVID numbers. Our pulse is currently about 70% of our pre-COVID numbers. And um, the express routes are just about 20% of pre-COVID. Uh, they're still consolidated, correct? Uh, we've not going back to the, the full breadth of the uh, express routes? That is correct. That uh, the express route, majority of express route riders are able to either use cars or telework. So we're supporting those that are unable to use those options. And do we have any idea where that will be going in the future? Uh, it really depends upon, at this time, our ability to regain our staffing levels and the return to work of the downtown community. Yes. If the downtown businesses you know, don't so have a strong yeah, return to work, we'll continue to keep express ridership low as people continue to telework. Uh, our resources right now need to be really consolidated around the pulse in our local bus routes to support the riders that are using the service. Okay, so this is partly uh, the result of and helping us deal with the shortage of personnel. 
Yes, sir. All right. Any further questions of this? Thank you for this report. All right, uh, Mr. Carter. Yeah. Morning, everyone. Morning. I'm going over the safety performance report for the month of October. This will be found in page 176 and 178 of the packet. Um, starting off with the results for this month, external events. In the month of September, we have 40. In the month of October, we had 37. Non-preventable events. In the month of September, we had 29. In the month of October, we had 23. Preventable events. In the month of September, we had 11. And in the month of October, we had 14. So we did see an increase in preventable events, but overall, we did see a decrease in the amount of total external events we had for the month. Specialized care. Passionary events, we had zero. Traffic events, we had five. Preventable were two, and they were minor fixed object type events. And non-preventable, we had three. Into the new event that we're gonna start reporting on, and this is unfortunate and I'm sure most of you have heard, um, this is not something that's localized to GRTC, but unfortunately this is going on throughout the nature. It's an issue we're seeing with assault on operators. We had one verbal um, assault this month, and it was basically just verbal threats, didn't lead to violence or anything of that nature. It was just a conflict between the operator and the passenger and it, it resulted in verbal threats. And we did have two physical situations. One was a situation where water was thrown on the operator. And unfortunately, we did have one fight. Fortunate thing is we didn't have any severe injuries resulting in that. But anytime you have a situation like that, you know, that's nothing that you'd like to hear. And I can tell you that from top down, Julie, Cheryl, everyone is committed so that we can do everything we possibly can to reduce the risk of that ever happening. Um, some of the things that we are putting in place and have already put in place are safety meetings. Um, most of you know that pre-COVID, we haven't had any type of safety meetings in person. Right. I'm happy and excited to report that we are having safety meetings starting this, this week and actually starting today. One of the excellent things that we're having is we're partnering with Richmond Police Department and the Community yeah. Care Unit. We actually have one of the officers coming out from right. the Richmond Police Department to give certain um, techniques and ideas on how to handle certain situations, things that they see going on in the community. They're giving tips to the operators to how to recognize certain situations and how to um, deal with those situations. Another thing that we're putting in place is we're starting our de-escalation training. This is an annual training that we put together virtually. And that's actually rolling out this week as well. And the operators will go on virtually, sign on, take the actual training, and we can keep track on who's actually um, doing those trainings. Another thing that we have coming out is the training department. Now, Tim mentioned that uh, the training department has a class now, and it's the first time we've had double digit um, operators in that, in that training class. Well, we're also charging them with another piece of that, and they're putting together a uh, mini production with marketing, and shout out to Carrie and her team for helping with this. But what they're doing is they're putting together a role play exercise. This was actually a um, recommendation from one of our operators through our SMS, a suggestion, safety suggestion, that he has seen uh, working in other organizations, he has friends in other organizations, so kudos to that operator. But this is something that we're putting together where the training manager, along with um, some of the other training staff and safety staff, will actually do role plays and create situations that we're seeing out on the street. And we'll give them the opportunity to see what they should do and what they shouldn't do. So it's just a technique to allow them to be able to have certain um, measures to de-escalate situations and also look at things from a different way. Now, certainly, as I stated, we can't come up with every type of scenario. We can't come up with everything that's going to uh, create uh, a remedy to these type of situations. But as I stated, I'm thankful to Julie and Cheryl and, and GRTC executive team for not holding back on any type of resources. Whenever we go to them and we talk about this, 
we get what we need to make sure that we're putting everything in place so that we can give them the resources out on the street when these type of situations happen to do the best they can to de-escalate the situation and, and, and bring themselves and everybody home to a safe um, journey. Um, moving on, like I stated, we're working with every, every type of resource we can to um, put these goals out there through the safety management system. We're tracking and documenting everything. We're reducing, uh, putting every type of mitigation we can in place to reduce the risk of these assaults that are taking place. Uh, we've added another trainer coach to give more support to the operators when they're out on the street. Antonio Ramos, he started this week, or he started this month, I'm sorry, and he's already been a tremendous asset to the training department as well. So that's just a few things that you know we're, we're putting in place we certainly don't want to see anything. I don't want to uh, report any type of assaults with anybody um, in these monthly meetings. So those are the things that we're putting in place to try to reduce um, these, these type of things from happening. And if there, are any, if there are no questions, that concludes the report for the month of October. Thanks, Mr. Carter. Are there any questions or discussion here? Yeah, I, I, I'd, I'd like to say something. I mean, we have to always consider when we're seeing any of these things, um, the, the overall environment that we're in right now. I mean, we see that, um, and, and it's, you know, coming out of the, well, can't say coming out of the pandemic, but as people are getting out more from being um, cooped up and all that, um, there is a, just a general rise in aggression in our um, society. We are seeing that there's more you know, violent crime, um, you know, we're just seeing, um, you know, what we're seeing on air, airplanes and what we're seeing in restaurants and what we're seeing across the board um, is going to affect um, GRTC as well. So um, I applaud the administration for, um, you know, getting, uh, you know, getting ahead of this as best they can to, um, you know, train the drivers on de-escalation and, and all these things, but we have to also understand we're those same people. You know, our, our operators are the same, you know, same folks that are living in this situation. So we're sort of amped up too. I know I go, I'm sort of amped up um, because of this. So, um, you know, we, we, we just have to do the best we can in this situation. But what we're seeing is that, um, you know, what is happening everywhere, um, you know, is, is, is happening here as well. And um, so I, I applaud all efforts to get out in front of it and uh, um, support our operators 100% in um, dealing with this in a um, very challenging environment. That's all I have. Thank you. Yeah, just one quick comment to Ms. what Mr. Braxton said, even though I reported the verbal, I mean, there's so much other stuff that goes on and kudos to our operators because I can tell you that, you know, if every situation was handled or had to be handled by administration, we would be stopped every day. So the operators do an excellent job right now of handling situations on their own and trying to make sure everybody's safe as possible. But um, I agree, it's, it's certainly something that's going on throughout the nation and in different industries everywhere. So thank you for that. Yeah, if, if I might add to that, uh, while Tony was briefing me about the incidents that happened on the bus, and the, the number of verbal versus physical assaults, the number is was very low in my mind. I, I asked him about that. He said, well, those are what we're reporting out, what we're reviewing are the ones that escalate to the point where the operators need uh, police or supervision assistance. There are dozens or hundreds of these. We have, with all the service we have out every day, where our operators are being um, verbally abused and they are de-escalating and handling it. And it is, definitely feeling on their part and on our part like it's epidemic that people's fuses are short and people are taking it out on our operators and um, our operators are in need of significant emotional and spiritual and physical support just to know that they aren't out there alone because they are handling these things just heroically. Yeah, thank you. Um, I, I'm really proud of the people who do this work for us and uh, for the community and um, it's really clear uh, what a significant uh, task it is. And uh, so thank you all very much for this. And thanks, Tony, for your work here. Um, a report now from uh, on maintenance from Mr. Byrne. 
Good morning. Good morning. Our KPIs for the month of October were 8,261 miles between roll calls. We have exceeded our goal, which is 5,200. Our PMs for the month of October were right at 90%, where our goal is 80%. Currently, 27% of our fleet is down for service, um, with a spare, spare ratio of 30%. As Mr. Barham said earlier, the new vehicles have come in and we're in the process of uh, preparing them for service. Uh, we continue to clean and disinfect the entire fleet as well as the building, and we also power wash our bus stops daily. That completes the maintenance report. All right, thank you. 27% uh, of the fleet is done for service. How does that relate to what's normal here? Normally, we like to keep it right at uh, 10 or 9%. Because of the uh, low amount of employees we have right now, we are struggling, but we are trying to make sure we get things done in a timely manner. Okay. The good news is, is that uh, HR did report out yesterday that we have a number of good applicants. We just need to finish the process and get them in. So uh, I, we are hopeful that we'll see a turn here, but until we get the people in here to support the staff, staff's working overtime to get those buses on the street and we're, we're, they're pushing through. And so we're hoping that these uh, that these new buses won't need as many repairs. Is that part of it, Tony? <laughs> they, they, they better not. Any, they shouldn't <laughs> need any repairs. Uh, well, I don't know about you, but um, anyway. <laughs> Yes, uh, Tim, did you have something else? Okay. All right, thank you very much. Any further questions? All right, um, we have some action items. Tim's got a Uber, is this your proposal? I mean, you, you present this? Yes, sir. Okay, go for it. And I will share my screen. So this is located on page 180 of the board packet. And just to give you a little background, back last month, October the 26th, uh, the Board of Directors uh, approved uh, our recommendation uh, to implement some service changes in December uh, to adjust for the staffing shortages. Uh, these changes uh, mainly will affect some of the low frequency routes, uh, but one of the biggest impacts that are gonna affect us uh, will be between the hours of 11 p.m. to 2 a.m. and 5 a.m. to 6 a.m. Uh, so we want to implement a fully subsidized uh, Uber trips uh, for customers uh, that may be impacted during that period of time that I just mentioned. Uh, so just to give you a brief little highlights with this pilot program, uh, customers would have the ability uh, to contact Uber uh, and to be able to uh, basically uh, get a ride from one bus stop to another bus stop. Uh, no more than two rides uh, per 24 hour period uh, to make sure that those folks that are uh, at work, for example, during those critical hours uh, will still be able to get a level of service from us uh, to be able to get to their destination safely. Uh, this program would be implemented by the uh, ARPA funds uh, and the recommendation is uh, that the board of directors authorizes the CEO uh, to execute this pilot program uh, for a period of six months, uh, not to exceed $250,000 uh, with Uber to provide uh, this augmented fixed route service. So this is one of the things we've worked out uh, to enable us to, uh, to deal with the shortage of staff is chopping off um, some late, late night hours on some routes and some early morning hours, um, but trying to make sure that anyone who is affected by that can in fact be served uh, through this experimental uh, Uber program. Um, yes, sir. Are, are, good. Are there, and, uh, and it's really been talked through at, at length. I think it's going to be interesting. We'll learn a lot from it. Um, yes, and, and also one of the goals is, uh, as we move forward with this, uh, some of that data uh, from this kind of micro transit uh, scenario uh, to see how we operate, what type of passenger needs are going to be, uh, and as we move forward regionally uh, to see what kind of other programs we can implement in the area as well. And it really, just to underline this, it represents our commitment to make sure that no one is left stranded because we've had to chop the ends off the service a little bit. Yes, sir. Okay, um, further comments or questions? Could I have a motion to approve this? So moved. 
Second. Second. Any further discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed. It's passed. Thank you very much, Mr. Barr. First transit renewal. Yes, I'm back again. Um, <laughs> so let me share uh, one more time my screen. Uh, and yes, specialized transportation services. You know, back in 2017, uh, we put out a bid uh, for specialized transportation services. Uh, First Transit uh, was the best, highest, uh, best uh, bidder for that service. Uh, and they had a, a, a contract that was established for three base years with two uh, one year uh, extensions. So on September the 17th of 2017, the Board of Directors uh, authorized uh, staff uh, with the recommendation to proceed forward uh, with uh, that contract with First Transit. Uh, and we're coming back uh, as our requirement uh, under the uh, guidelines to move forward with the second year uh, of, the, of the options. Uh, just to give you some brief highlights, uh, over the past three year base, uh, First Transit has uh, improved the service. Uh, they did make strides to address some operational issues and concerns uh, that was e existing with the prior service. Uh, we're still working with them on continued service improvements, staffing challenges that they've had as well uh, on, on the paratransit side. Uh, so we'll continue to work with them as we move forward. Uh, First Transit will continue to operate uh, basically uh, do uh, the staffing portion of the service. So they'll be doing the scheduling, the hiring, uh, management staff, uh, the operators, uh, call center, and so forth. Uh, GRTC will maintain the uh, maintenance of the vehicles and also to provide uh, a facility for the uh, operation to take place with First Transit. The payment will be con uh, continuing with our revenue hours. Uh, and with as we did with prior years, uh, there will be a revenue cap uh, to make sure that they do not exceed uh, that amount. Uh, and for year option two, there was an adjustment that had to be made uh, due to driver, staff, uh, and insurance I increases. Uh, and they are as follows. Uh, for the last, for the second year option two, uh, the revenue hour uh, was at $37.78 uh, you know, with a projected total of 5.2 million. Uh, but in agreement, uh, we looked at the, uh, you know, the, the finances and, and so forth. Uh, we made a, uh, an adjustment of $2.47, uh, which increased it to uh, $340,000. Uh, so that put that year option to amount uh, at $40.25 uh, with a total of 5.5 million. Now we also had to go back and retro for the earlier part of 2021 as well. Uh, and that was the amount of 243,106, uh, which for the year option two total, uh, that last line that you see there uh, at the $40.25 rate of almost a little under 4.8 million. Uh, now this is projected uh, for this coming year uh, of about 138,000 uh, revenue hours uh, for option year two. Uh, our annual budget for last year, uh, we finished at about 4.7 million for fiscal year 21. Uh, and our budget for fiscal year 22 uh, was set at 5.4 million. Uh, however, as we move forward into fiscal year uh, 23, uh, we're looking to balance those funding levels out uh, so that we make sure that we are uh, fiscally responsible uh, as we move forward into that following year. Uh, this program is entirely uh, supported through federal, state, local operational funds, uh, as well as uh, COVID relief funding. Uh, so the recommendation is that the board of directors approves the CEO to execute uh, option year two, uh, a first transit contract uh, with increased negotiated rate uh, due to uh, union negotiated wages uh, for fiscal year 21 and 22, uh, not to exceed the total amount of 5.78 uh, million dollars uh, for the provision of specialized transportation services. Thank you. Can I have someone to uh, make that motion? I have a question. Oh, yeah, we'll get to it in just a second. Let's get the motion up there. Uh, so moved. Second, please. 
Second. Yeah, I'm interested in Eldridge and your question and comments from anybody on the board. You guys have been working with this for a long, long time. Um, so go ahead. Um, Tim, did Fresh Transit sell out or change management companies? I, First Transit, no, no, I not not with First Transit. Um, I hadn't heard anything about um, any management change uh, with them. Um, only thing I've heard from any type of standpoint, uh, I know Greyhound was bought out, uh, you know, a few months ago, uh, you know, by Flixbus, I believe. But I hadn't heard anything on the First Transit front. Okay, I thought I heard something. Yeah, I did hear something, Tim, about a year ago that at a high level, but it has resulted in no change oh, yeah, in yeah. our right. internal management. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah, you're right, Julie. So when I came on the board like three years ago, um, this was a, 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 a monthly topic of conversation. Um, are you guys, uh, you guys happy with this? Uh, overall, yes. Uh, the last few months, uh, you've seen in the reports as well, uh, there has been a, uh, you know, a slight uh, decrease or decrease in the on-time performance. Uh, they've had to deal with challenges on the operation side as well uh, with operators and so forth. That's, one, that's the reason why uh, they brought Userb on board uh, to help uh, with those uh, operational challenges uh, and so forth. So uh, we hope that that, as we move into the months ahead, uh, that will turn around and move into a positive direction. But overall, uh, through the years that they've been exist, been here since 2017, we have been pleased with them overall. Eldridge, Gary, George, Danny. I just asked that question. I'm good with it. I, I, I see no problem with first training. Okay. You know. Eldridge, it's very hard to hear you. Not hearing. Our apologies, Mr. Coles. It, we were unable to hear you at this time. No, I was saying that uh, I see no problem with Fresh Transit. Like Tim said, they've been around for quite a while and uh, we never had a major problem. Hey, Tim, I have a quick question. Um, yes. Can you give us a, a general feel for, you know, we, we established that relationship with you, sir, before it sounds like you said First Transit now has a relationship with you, sir. Is that separate from our relationship with them? Yes, that is separate. You know, uh, and just to give you and maybe listening a brief background, uh, we partnered with Userve uh, back in 2017 uh, to start our care on demand service. Uh, you know, that is a premium service uh, that is an option for our paratransit customers uh, to provide a same day service or reservations. Uh, direct, nonstop, uh, no shared ride. Uh, and we consistently have about 11, 12% of our uh, paratransit customers that have shifted and moved over to that service. So user, we were one of their first uh, partners. Uh, they have grown tremendously over the years. Uh, and, and, and we're pleased with them on, the, uh, on that service. Uh, what they have done is they also have partnerships with First Transit uh, and other places around the country uh, to do actual prayer transit service. Uh, they are unique in that they are an adaptive, adaptive, adaptive TNC. Uh, so they do require their uh, drivers, even though they're independent operators, uh, to go through uh, random drug testing, uh, training and so forth to follow the FTA guidelines. Uh, so what First Transit has done is, and they have the option within their contract to do so with our approval, uh, is to bring on a subcontractor to assist with the paratransit side. So that is a separate contract uh, that First Transit has with uh, user uh, to help them with the uh, paratransit side of the house. Yeah, okay, thank you. Tim, real quick, can you um, walk through, through the math for me just so I understand um, the how the $2.47 was, was calculated and if that was an expected increase um, in adjustment, if that's in line with what we normally have, um, just so I can understand where now, our, our CFAO, John, so eloquently put that together for us. Uh, okay. I uh, was involved in the process. You know, I can try to explain it to you. Uh, <laughs> no, I, yeah, the main thing, yeah, as long as I just understand how it was, you know. I, I, was, can, defer to, I, I can sure. defer to John, so maybe he can give you more of a uh, analytical uh, aspect of it. But we looked at, you know, just in general terms, 
you know, the, you know, the, the driver wages, particularly with their new labor agreement. Uh, that went into effect uh, earlier this year. Uh, that was the biggest thing. And, and we didn't want to necessarily look at, you know, whatever overhead or other expenses uh, that uh, First Transit may be experiencing and, and try to push that cost over to us. We wanted to strictly look at it from the operator standpoint. If you were putting money into the operator's pocket uh, to help with them, uh, as well as, you know, slight increase in terms of what insurance has been and so forth, uh, that's what we were focused on, and the and the and that dollar figure was basically attributed to that. I hope I answered the question, John. Help me if I said anything that wasn't correct. <laughs> yeah, that's very accurate. Um, when First Transit had reached out earlier in the year, they had uh, a bunch of items they wanted to add into the uh, first year option rate, and we basically focused on. Uh, their average wage rates prior to the adjustment were about $13.26 an hour and post with the new union contract is up to $15.73. So um, along lines, uh, you know, to, to provide a, a living wage to their drivers, as well as, you know, some of the issues they cited about increased uh, liability for uh, vehicle liability policies. You know, I expressed to them that, you know, if you pay a little higher wage, you may get a better quality driver and therefore you would lower your own risk management. Rate. So, <laughs> you know, so that, yeah, you know, we felt that it, as long as the money went back to the drivers, and that's what the the uh, retroactive adjustment is showing the detail to prove that it went back. Um, they've supplied copies of the union contract before and after, so that we can we're very comfortable that that's where the increase the uh, increased uh, amount for revenue hour went. Okay. All right. Any further questions? Conversation. It's been moved and seconded that. Um, that we approve this first transit renewal for a year. All in favor say aye. Aye. All opposed? It's been approved. Thank you, Tim Barham. You're welcome. Oh, Rob, we get to talk about Hastis again. How exciting. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chair. Good morning. Good morning. So uh, as, as the board is aware, Hastis is the software that we utilize at GRTC to do all of our planning, our scheduling, and the maintenance of the drivers clocking in and out as far as payroll. It is the core central system that designs and creates all of our routes and manages those routes for us throughout the, uh, throughout the period of the booking. Um, our annual maintenance for Jiro again is due. Um, this is a sole source procurement. Only Jiro can provide this annual support and maintenance agreement. The maintenance agreement for 2022 is $161,936, and that's an increase of 3% over last year's costs. This procurement is going to be full or is fully funded with federal, state, and local funds. So our recommendation is that the board of directors authorize the CEO to issue a purchase order to Jero not to exceed the amount of $161,936 for the renewal of this maintenance. All right, could I have a motion to approve that? So moved. Second. Second. It's really pretty neat to be the sole source of something. Um. <laughs> yeah, mo most software vendors are the sole source of their maintenance. <laughs> yeah, that's pretty amazing. All right. Uh, any further conversation, question? Uh, all in favor of approving this uh, contract uh, with Jero, please say aye. Aye. Uh, uh. All opposed? It passes. Thank you very much. Um, Thank you, Mr. Taggart. Yep. CEO's report. Uh, Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the board. First of all, congratulations on your reappointment and uh, to the, the officers. One more year. Yay. Yeah, uh, the salary, you know? the salary didn't go up, though, I don't think. Um, <laughs> well, that is a uh, very that efficient. Is a, you and your share. <laughs> Actually, if you uh, with the current inflation, it actually went down. So, <laughs> for the record, uh, GRTC does not set that; that is set by the shareholders. Right. So, uh, so, Mr. Chairman, members of the board, uh, first thing that on my my agenda to talk with you about today, I have uh, four different items: is the vaccine mandate. Uh, last month, that GRTC announced that we would have a vaccine mandate. Uh, in advance of the Biden administration's and OSHA um, temporary standards, that mandate was to become effective on November, November 24th. Uh, it is still on target to become effective on November 24th. However, we are looking at softening some of the requirements in that. 
Last night, we met with union leadership here locally, discussed that policy, um, which currently as written could result in some significant suspensions of staff as soon as November 24th for those who have not received their vaccination. Uh, based on our discussions with the union, we'll likely be modifying that policy so that anyone who has at least their first shot or who is within that 90-day recovery of being sick will have a grace period to finish the vaccination process. Uh, last month, we had about 120 to 130 employees or, or so who were not fully vaccinated or who had not reported their status to us. As of yesterday, that number is down to about 70 employees. So we have made a significant move positively. Right now, of that 70, fewer than 40 operators are in the category of unvaccinated or unreported. So uh, the union has been very supportive of us moving towards pushing vaccinations. Um, we are looking very closely at the, the, leg or the legal judicial review that's going on with the Biden administration and the circuit courts across the country. And uh, we are looking to try and make sure that we have a high vaccination rate when we have 70 to 80 percent of our employees who are vaccinated, um, we need to continue to protect them and their choices to protect their families, the staff, the riders here. So anyone without at least their first shot by November 24th still risks suspension. They've all received letters a couple of weeks ago. This has been on the books for a couple of months. Definitely anyone not fully vaccinated by January 4th, which is the date set by the Biden administration's OSHA rules does risk termination. Our goal is zero terminations, zero suspensions. We definitely hope that we will get there. Now, as I just mentioned, uh, item number two, last night, Cheryl Adams, Joe Dillard, and I did meet with the local 1220 Union Executive Board to discuss not only the vaccine mandate, but also other concerns the union have expressed regarding CRTC safety, our scheduling process for our, our service, the outsourced operational support, such as the Uber, Uber contract, and their pay in general. The conversation lasted for over uh, almost two hours, and it did result in a list of new safety measures. And we had some further conversations on possible bonus pay pilot that we've been discussing for several months. Um, we talked about opportunities for operators and other vendors to support that late night on-demand service along with the Uber contract. So you'll be hearing more about, it's not just Uber, Uber's just the one that that we're fast tracking to get the contract in place, but we have other opportunities for operators to work overtime with premium pay to support those late night services. And we have a wide range of new safety initiatives we've been talking about and activities that you heard from Tony and we got from the union that are already being put in place. Uh, we committed to the union last night as we have committed for the past couple of years that we will continue these discussions. They also agreed to reestablish our, our monthly meetings, uh, possibly even biweekly so we can continue to keep the dialogue open and hear more from operators and maintenance and allow them to have better and early opportunity to hear about and be involved in key management decisions. So it was a very productive meeting and it was a bit, I left very optimistic. Now, focusing on that rider and operator safety, um, I will be preparing a presentation over the next two days for the City of Richmond City Council Safety Committee to discuss specifically the safety of transit. Uh, in short, let me get right to the punchline. GRTC buses are safe. With the escalation of gun violence and, and violence across the country and within this region, GRTC, GRTC did have our first fatal shooting in our staff's records or collective memory. But we do have a wide range of actions that we're taking to be more, be more proactive. We know that gun violence across the country was worse in 2020 than it's ever been and worse in 2021 than it was in 2020 what we're doing about that. Most of these you already heard from Tony. The interactive role playing with security team and police. Uh, police at safety meetings and staff meetings to address concerns and to provide new tools. Additional de-escalation training for our, our team. Messaging, both visual and auditory, on buses about riders' responsibilities and riding being a privilege, not a right, in addition to reminders that they are on camera. New technology on our buses, we're working towards new technology that could potentially connect buses directly to emergency responders for a faster response time, which the response time has been good, but it can always be better. And we're getting better information to our operators directly about banned riders who have violated our policies and what happens to those riders through the police action if they get arrested and prosecuted so that we no longer have to worry about them being on our buses 
it is a very few, a uh, minor number of people, I mean, negligible that, that this happens to, but our operators need better information and communication to understand that they're supported and they have that back up out there, both by our own staff and with the police. I'll also be asking city council and all of our city and county partners to recommit to having uniformed police officers riding on transit as part of their duties. Just having that occasional random uniform police on our buses does help. It makes our operators feel more secure and it lets people know that this is a, a safe place to ride. We don't have all the solutions, but we did have a good start on making solid improvements already and we are going to continue to improve. This is our commitment to staff, our riders, and our community. Now, uh, board meetings in 2020, uh, we discussed the December board meeting, but I would like to remind all board members, all of our staff, our partners and public, that we will be meeting in person starting January 18th. That um, the, we've been acting under the city of Richmond, a state of emergency that is uh, scheduled to end in December 31st. So in January, we'll meet in person. That will be at the RRTPO, the Richmond Regional Transportation Planning Organization meeting room or the Plan RVA, courtesy of Plan RVA. The address, and we'll send this out and make it public shortly, is 9211 Forest Hill Avenue, Richmond, Virginia, 23235. It does have transit access, has plenty of space for us to spread out. Uh, through their technology and our technology, the team's been working together. We'll still have a virtual option for people who cannot or choose not to attend in person. And Mr. Chairman, members of the board, I am very hopeful that all of our team and all of you have a very happy Thanksgiving holiday or other celebrations that you might have with your family members that you stay safe, you stay vaccinated, and uh, we all have a very quiet holiday season. Uh, we will see you in December. Mr. Chairman, members of the board, if there are no questions, that concludes the CEO's report for October. Thank you. Any further comments from board members? Uh, it's It's been a, a serious month here and I'm very grateful for the quality of the people working with us to make this system a healthy and positive system for the metropolitan city. It's one of the really encouraging places um, that we have and folks are really, are really doing their best. And uh, I want to thank uh, the CEO and the other members of the staff uh, for their earnest work, um, both at the management level and at the operations level. Um, and uh, if there are no further comments, um, I declare this meeting of the board of GRT 